Acts chapter 18, verse 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 18. Kevin DeYoung, in his excellent book that I would recommend about the Bible called Taking God at His Word, writes this, Every true Christian should feel deep in his bones an utter dependence on God's self-revelation in the Scriptures. An utter dependence on God's self-revelation in the Scriptures. It's important to get in touch with that deep feeling of utter dependence on God's self-revelation when we start reading God's holy, inerrant, authoritative word. We bring ourselves under this word to direct our lives, and we receive this word to transform our lives. Let's begin reading in Acts 18, verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. May God bless the preaching of his word. In our living room, we we have a bookcase, and at the bottom of it, there's a shelf full of family photo albums. And every once in a while, one of my children will go and pull one of those out and just start leafing through the pages of photo albums and remembering all the memories that come to mind about birthday parties and vacations and cute moments together. I'm sure many of you have photo albums somewhere in your home as well. And there's snapshots, snapshots of life. Obviously, you can't take pictures of every single moment, although I think in our modern age, people certainly are trying. They're doing their absolute best to take picture of every single moment. Um, And yet, normally, historically, you take snapshots of some moments, and you're trying to pick the moments that will help you remember what is most important to you or the moments that will bring you back into a moment of history. That's the goal of snapshots, uh, since you can't take them comprehensively. Uh, Well, Luke faces that challenge when he writes the book of Acts. He's trying to take what is, in effect, a snapshot of the early church. It's actually quite remarkable. This book, which in my Bible is about 30 pages long, 30 pages of text in in this book, 30 pages that covers about 30 years of church history. So you think about that. I have biographies at home. I like reading biographies. And and I'll have, uh, you know, something like 800-page biographies covering a person's life of, say, you know, 60 or 70 years or 800 pages. Luke takes 30 pages to cover 30 years. A page a year is about what he gives himself. And so every paragraph, every sentence, every word in that kind of a succinct summary is a precious valuable snapshot. Now, if you're like me, you might wonder why Acts 18, 18 to 22 made the cut. I mean, don't you wonder a little bit why this made the cut? If we have such a succinct, such a focused account, 30 years in 30 pages, Luke, 
Why? Why is this here? Paul getting a haircut. Paul leaving his friends in Ephesus. Paul went to the synagogue again. Paul got on a boat. Paul went home. Is this really worth a paragraph? Why, why is this snapshot? Isn't this like one of those snapshots you see in your phone when you're paging through and you think, why did I keep that one? That one's like blurry and nonsense. Delete. Move on to the exciting one. Why didn't Luke, in his review of his book, say, oh wait, why, why do I have Paul returns to Antioch? Why didn't I just skip? Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Maybe one verse of transition and then on to, now there was a Jew named Apollos. Why this paragraph? Well, I think if we take a close look we see in the details of this snapshot a summary of the Apostle Paul and a summary of the purpose of the church's mission. We see, and in a sense, it's, it's made more meaningful precisely because it is a somewhat mundane moment. That even in the mundane moment, Paul is captivated by a dedication to this mission and to the Lord. All of the book of Acts is, is all about how God, the sovereign Lord, and Jesus Christ, the ascended Messiah, is advancing his gospel. We've talked about that repeatedly. It, it all t connects with that theme. The Lord is advancing his gospel. And this snapshot seems to indicate how the Lord does that, even in a mundane kind of moment. The Lord always advances his gospel through the surrendered dedication of his people. The Lord always advances his gospel through the surrendered dedication of his people. We see in this snapshot a man who is dedicated to the mission of God. He is dedicated to it. He has surrendered himself to it. And that's the man God is using to advance the gospel. And it invites us, I think, though we're not Paul, and we don't serve God in precisely the same way. We do serve God with the same calling of dedication. That we are also to dedicate ourselves such that the Lord uses us for the advancement of his gospel and the building of his kingdom. So where am I seeing this dedication? Because as I said, it is a potentially obscure snapshot. So why do I think the key kind of central theme of this is God using a dedicated servant? Why do I think this? Let me walk through three elements of dedication that I think are present in this passage. Three aspects of dedication. First of all, Paul is dedicated ultimately and foundationally to the Lord. He is dedicated to the Lord. Let's look down there closely. I want to look at several different aspects of this paragraph that points to Paul's dedication to the Lord. First of all is his his absolute ruthless determination to be on the move for the gospel. Paul finally, after his lengthy period of persecution in Thessalonica and Berea and Philippi, he finally has come to a city in Corinth where the Lord has given him an extended, and it's not even that extended, it's a year and a half, but it's a year and a half at least, time to establish the church. I mean, finally, the guy who wants to preach the gospel and establish churches gets enough time to linger and maybe have part two on a couple of messages, where he can actually share a little bit longer about the gospel than just believe in Jesus and he's hustled out of town. I mean, this is a chance for him. He's been able to stay there. And yet, Paul will not settle. Because for Paul, the calling is broader than one church. Now, that's not unique, or that is unique to Paul. Not every Christian has that same calling. But Paul, as we know from his conversion and the call of God when he met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road, he is called to more than just one church. He is called to many churches and the building up. That's his unique call in church history. And he will not give up that call and get into a complacent plateau of lingering in Corinth. So just notice overall, just the movement of this passage. He stayed many days longer, but then he takes leave of the brothers and he sets sail for Syria, taking with him his new friends, Priscilla and Aquila. Then he comes to Ephesus. He preaches there. They asked him to stay longer, but he declined. But he says, I'll come back to you if the Lord wills. 
Then he goes to Caesarea. He goes up to the church, most likely the church in Jerusalem. And then he goes down to Antioch. Finally, he's back home. He spends a little time there. But what does he do? He departs and goes from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, where he had already been strengthening the churches there. So we, we just see this, this man on the move picture in this snapshot, don't we? If, if this is a snapshot, it's a, it's a moving snapshot. It's a snapshot of Paul in motion. He goes from Corinth. He goes to Ephesus. He goes down to Caesarea, up to Jerusalem, down to Antioch, and then up again to Galatia. He is on the move. And it's consistent with what we see in the rest of the book. Luke is, is at pains to determine, to, to paint Paul as a man consumed with movement in keeping with his calling. So we see this dedication to fulfilling his calling as a man on the move. We also see in two other important details this dedication to the Lord. Notice the somewhat unexpected inclusion in, in verse 18 there, at the, verse 18b, at Centuria he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. Of all the obscure things for Luke to include, he includes this haircut and he includes where it was in Centria. Now, why in the world? Well, it's really important when we come to an obscure detail in the Bible to not spend all of our time speculating on what we don't know and miss what we do know. So this is one of those times. We are not told precisely what kind of vow it was. Uh, Jewish people had a couple of different kind of vows. This could have been a Nazarite vow. It just could have been a vow of dedication, a vow of trust. We're not told that. We're not told precisely what the goal of this vow was. Did it point backwards to his protection in Corinth? Did it point forward to his journey to Jerusalem? We're not told. Vows normally are an expression of dedicating yourself to the protection of the Lord. We do know that about Jewish vows, that they were expression of dedicating yourself to the service and the protection of the Lord. And so in some way, Paul, in this vow that he's taken, that he is saying to the Lord, I commit myself, I dedicate myself to your protection. You are the one who protected me in the past, perhaps, or you are the one who will protect me in the future. I'm either commemorating that I was dedicated to you and you were faithful, or I am surrendering my future to your protection. And one way or the other, Paul is declaring himself to have been or to be under the protection and sovereignty of God. That's what he's doing right now. Very, very important that we understand this. Whatever else we know about this vow, we know that's what Paul is doing. David Peterson uh, makes this comment about the vow. Paul voluntarily continued certain Jewish practices because he did not see them to be inconsistent with his new status in Christ. Nevertheless, his lifestyle and his whole focus on salvation through faith in Christ must have raised many questions about the continuing role of the law for Jews in the Messianic era. If you want more on that, I did two messages last year on the role of the law in the Christian life. Making a vow and shaving the head when it was completed was a way of demonstrating his trust in God and showing loyalty to, to the traditions of Israel without compromising his gospel message. Perhaps such gestures allowed Paul to walk more freely with fellow Jews about the gospel. One way or another, Luke includes this to indicate Paul is a man who has surrendered his safety and his trust, has dedicated himself to the Lord. So much so that he's even taking vows to commemorate that, to indicate that, to show that to those that would know what a vow means in that culture. Another detail I think we're going to notice. Notice down in verse 21, these Apparently, Jews who have been listening to him with appreciation in Ephesus ask for him to stay longer. And he says something been very important that Luke is wanting to include this. Why does Luke include this little sentence from Paul in this little interaction at the end of Ephesians in his massive book on 30 years of church history? Why this detail? He wants to paint a picture of Paul as a man who knows, I am at the discretion of the Lord. So I'm pointing at three details that we might not see at first glance. First of all, Paul's movement. 
Then this strange reference of a haircut and a vow. And then Paul's use of the phrase, if the Lord wills. What does this snapshot show? It shows a man who is dedicated in a surrendered and trusting way to the will of the Lord for his life. He is not a man who is dedicated only to his own future, his own preferences, his own priority. He is surrendered to the will of the Lord. He is trusting God's protection. He is on the move because God has called him to be a moving Christian. He is a man who declares, God and God alone has authority over my life. My life is surrendered to him. Every moment, even the details of where I end up, is in the hands of the Lord. Now, again, we might just read this and think, well, that's okay, good for Paul, he got a haircut. And you move on. I think Luke's trying to indicate something. Even in the mundane moments of life, the the things that people could easily overlook, the, the things that people could easily not have noticed. But Paul Paul moves all the time. Who's to know if he didn't keep what he promised and vowed as an expression of worship in God's protection? Who's to know that? He's never in the same community. Who's who's to know that Paul needs to say to the Ephesians, I will come back to you, but ultimately it's not my will that matters, it's the Lord's will. Who cares? He's under no, no obligation to come back to them. He could certainly just make a promise and say, I'll, I'll, I'll be back to you. And how are they to know if he doesn't come or he does come? I might just say, boy, I, I can't tell you why I can be back or not. I'll let you know. He, he's at pains to emphasize Paul is a man surrendered in dedication and trust to the Lord. And this is very valuable to us because we see this throughout the book of Acts. And though no one is uniquely gifted like Paul, every Christian should have the same wholehearted dedication to the Lord. Every one of us should say about our life, it is according to the will of the Lord. My life is surrendered to his trust and direction. I am, as it were, a mobile servant at the direction of my master. Now, you might not be moving from town to town or city to city like Paul does, but your days are at the discretion, my days are at the discretion of the Lord. They they are under the governance of the Lord. They are surrendered to the purpose of the Lord. They, They are, in a sense, lifted up to God as Paul does with the vow and with his expressions and with his movement. They're saying, Lord, I am yours to command. I give you my days and my life. And we see this throughout the book of Acts. The church is the willing servant of the Lord to be used by him to do his will and spread his gospel in all their unique ways and unique gifts and unique callings and services and locations. Priscilla and Aquila are not Paul, but they have their own way of dedicating their lives in that same way. Look, you and I have a calling from the Lord to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. And this runs countercultural to our self-focused and self-indulgent culture. Our culture and our hearts are naturally self-focused and self-indulgent. But the scriptures call us to a God-focused and a God-surrendered way of life. So that when we look forward for our families, for our lives, we are saying, Lord, what what would you have me do? How can I fulfill the callings that I have received in your word? How can this day and next week and next year be useful to the Lord? So that our goal in every decision that we make, whether financial or personal, is to showcase our obligation to be the servants of the Lord. The Lord is not merely a comforting bumper to our life in the fast lane. The Lord is the one directing us in his direction. Very important difference. He's not this comforting bumper to our life so that we roll the way we want to roll and he makes sure we don't get too far into the gutter. No, the Lord is the one directing our life and giving us our priorities and establishing our principles. Let's ask the question, 
Is there any way where we are thinking of the Lord as the comforting bumper in the lanes of our life and the rest of our life is dedicated to enjoying ourselves and our families and our certain pleasures that we enjoy and having a nice, comfortable life? Or do we view our life as being in the hands, in the will of the Lord, directed to his protection and care? It's worth examining, just in your own mind right now. Okay, where in my life am I holding on to something where I might say, well, that's out of bounds for God to do anything with me. I I, want to hold on to this. This isn't the will of the Lord. (laughs) That I would give this up or that I would serve in this way or that I would honor the Lord in that way or that I would even put myself in a situation that would be dangerous or concerning enough where I would have to desperately ask the Lord for protection as Paul did with this vow. Well, no, that's that's not for me, that's for a different kind of person altogether. No, no, every Christian in their own way, in their own context, should be asking, how can I dedicate my life in greater and greater ways to you, Lord? That that, that might mean that we announce, say, a church plant in some day in the future, and you don't immediately turn off the possibility of you going. I might mean that. Hey, we're going to plant a church. We've got a guy. We think he's wants to lead this church, and we'd like you to pray about whether God might call you to go. I think most Christians would say, oh, isn't that good for those that might be willing to do such a thing? No. Every Christian should instantly be asking, Lord, Lord, would you lay on my heart a burden to do that? Or we announce a mission trip to support a church work in some other country, and you instantly think, oh, good for the singles. I mean, praise God for singles that can go and just use it. You use it. You use those single years. Amen, those undivided years. And we will absolutely listen to you when you come back. No, the, the, the question should be, no, am I called to do this? I'm not called to a self-protected, uh, like, turn up the comfort life. I'm called to a Christ-centered, God-directed life. It, it, it might be when, when the care group gets too big, and it's like, man, we can't even get to everybody to share what God's doing in their life, and so we need to kind of multiply the group, and actually, would you be open to kind of go in with a new leader and start in that? I know that's uncomfortable, and new friends, and who wants to do that, and the awkward new friendship phase, and, and, and you're going to say, no, I don't want to do that. No, no, that's the point of, of, of God's calling of Paul and him as this example for the church, no, I'm, I'm willing to do what would honor the Lord, what would dedicate my life to the Lord. There's countless ways where we might apply this. But, but it's worth seeing in this snapshot, really just as a microcosm, of all that we see in Acts. Paul as this exemplary Christian, in addition to his foundational apostolic role. Paul's the one that said, follow me as I follow Christ. So yes, we are to follow Paul's example. Other than Jesus, uh, more is written about Paul, and with possible exception of Peter, than anybody else in the New Testament. The biographical description of Paul is intended to inspire the church, not to all be apostles, but to all be dedicated to the same gospel in the way that he is. He is dedicated to the Lord. Two of the things he's dedicated to, I think we see here, he is dedicated to the lost. He is dedicated to the Lord, and he is dedicated to the lost. It it strikes me that given the crushingly difficult ministry trip that Paul just took, he could very reasonably just focus on getting home. I mean, (laughs) what would be more reasonable? He was beaten in Philippi. He was put in prison. The Thessalonians chased him out of their town, chased him 45 miles to Berea. He's facing these kinds of things again and again. Wouldn't it be reasonable for him to get home? And yet, when he stops in Ephesus, what does he do again? I'm I'm making this point repeatedly in these passages because I think Acts 
just insists that the church readers of Luke's account stick their faces into Paul's dogged evangelism. And I need that because, frankly, I forget and I lose passion, and I lose interest, and I need Paul's doggedness to come to me and to motivate me again. He goes back into the synagogues again. Again he goes in there and reasons with the Jews, and Luke doesn't bother to include the content, but we know the content because he's already included all these sermons of Paul previous. So we know what he's doing. He's saying again, the Christ is Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. He is the one you're waiting for. If you believe in Jesus, you are set free from your sin. If you trust in Jesus, you are rescued from the wrath of God. If you turn your lives over to Jesus, you will be a part of what God is doing on the earth right now. Please, brothers and sisters, believe in Jesus. He is the Savior. And so he's reasoning with them again from the scriptures, appealing to them. And we know from what he says in Romans that his heart goes out to these Jewish members of these synagogues, that he is so distraught over the fact that so many of them have rejected Jesus. And you can feel the heart of Paul displayed in his determination to be dedicated to the lost. No, no, I'm going to go. There's a synagogue in Ephesus. I'm going in there, and I'm going to do what I can in the little time that I have here, and I'm going to try to appeal again. Brothers, the greater David has come. The one we've been waiting for, the great king, the suffering servant, he came, and he died on that cross, and if you believe in him, you can be reconciled to God. Believe in him. Trust in him. Know him. He is dedicated to the lost. Apparently, he has been somewhat persuasive because the Jews want to talk to him again. They're there. They ask him to stay. And Luke prefaces what's going to be a very lengthy ministry in Ephesus that we're going to read about in just a couple of chapters a very lengthy ministry where where Paul does come back and he stays and he preaches and he proclaims and he faces persecution again in this town. But for right now, you, you notice as he's preaching, they are wanting him to stay. They're wanting him to say more. Brothers and sisters, you and I and every Christian, we need the biblical picture of a gospel that goes to the lost. We are not Paul, but we believe in the same gospel that Paul believes in. We are not called to the scope. Let me just relieve what I think are unrealistic and somewhat burdensome and debilitating expectations. We are not called to the scope of Paul's evangelistic activity. All right? Christians are not called to the scope of of Paul's evangelistic activity. You are not the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm sorry if you, you know, or just think that way. and It's on your mirror, the apostle to the Gentiles. Look at him. No, if, if that's what you're thinking, you're not that, okay? You are not the apostle to the Gentiles. But you are a member in Christ. And Christ loves lost sheep. So we need that. We need the heart for the lost that Paul displays in his unique scope and authority to be displayed in our more limited scope and calling. We, we need that. I'll, I'll just tell you a simple way. Because this is, like, in, in my life, it's, it's like the evangelism for dummies version, okay? I don't have like the, you know, 47 ways of doing evangelism. I, I, in my mind, it's just, I need it to be very, very simple, Break it down for me, okay? I mean, that's what I need it to be. So here's what I'm doing in my life. I'm trying to have longer conversations with people I don't know very well. And I'm trying to seize obvious opportunities to talk longer with my neighbor. That's what I'm trying to do. And then I have one relative who I think has a very questionable um, status in the Lord and, and, and I, I, I just this week, I was preparing this message, and I, I sent them a message just to say, how are you? I was thinking about you. 
But what I'm trying to do is to put myself in situations where I can, I can have a conversation. Now, these are not synagogue Jews where the whole purpose of the meeting is to talk about God. And so it's very natural for Paul to stand up. I, I think it's somewhat unrealistic also to look at Paul and act like what he was doing all the time was street evangelism. No, he wasn't. He, he wasn't like always going you know, door to door. Hey, hey, do you want to believe in Jesus? No, he was going first into the synagogue where there was this natural context, that was often and almost always where he started. And he began proclaiming about Jesus to those who were already showing some interest. I'm not against door-to-door evangelism, nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying I think Christians think that's the only way you can take, acts, take action toward evangelism. I don't think that's true in the scriptures. I don't think we should feel that kind of absolute unique pressure. What Paul does do is he looks for contexts that are right there, and he begins to continue the conversation, looks for ways to include Jesus towards them. He goes into the synagogues. They're talking about God. I'm going to turn the conversation toward Jesus. We can do that. We can have a longer conversation with our neighbor. We can see how long the conversation might go with the the lady or the guy at Starbucks. We we, we could see whether there might be a relative who might be open to longer conversations where we could begin to include our testimony about the person and work of Jesus and maybe call them to consider that response for themselves. We can invite them to church where they'll hear the message of Jesus. There's these Gentiles that came into the Jewish synagogues. That's how they heard Paul. Well, probably someone invited them. We can do that too. We can say, come, I'd I love you to hear what we believe at my church. We can do that exact same thing. And we can have these longer conversations and these growing friendships and these initiatives towards people until so we build these conversations and we look for moments where we can insert the testimony of Jesus. If we are doing that, If we are building these conversations and having these friendships and looking for ways to bring them into a context where they can hear the gospel, we are fulfilling this devotion to the lost that Paul models in his unique calling. But if we are doing nothing, if we are avoiding, if we are limiting as much as we can any interaction with the lost, if we are hoping to avoid our neighbors, if we are avoiding the conversation with the unsaved relative, if we are hoping conversations with people that we might meet will be as short as possible, well then no, I I don't think we are then dedicating ourselves to the lost the way the Lord Jesus did toward us and the way Paul did in his life. We need to be taking steps that that demonstrate this kind of dedication to the lost, looking for ways to include them in our life and our conversation. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is not undoable. This is not impossible. This is not Billy Graham, who went home to be the Lord this week, thankfully is with Jesus now. This is not Billy Graham or nothing. This is possible. God does not call us. He calls us to things that are beyond our strength, but not that are objectively and literally impossible. No, he does not. He calls us to trust and obey Jesus. He calls us to that. He calls us to do that. Dedicated to the lost. Finally, finally, dedicated. I'm sorry, brother. I hate to interrupt, but... Yeah, I'm sorry, brother. Why don't, why don't we wait? And I'd love to talk to you after, but this isn't the time for, for doing that. Thank you, man. I appreciate it very much. Finally, dedicated to the church. Dedicated to the church. Notice again what Paul does. Notice what Paul does. <laughs> after he finally gets close to home. You notice down there where it says he landed at Caesarea? So Caesarea is not that far. It's basically the port you would, you would, you know, boat to if you're coming to get to Jerusalem. So it's right there. And then it says, he went up and greeted the church. Now, we're not from that area, and so this doesn't seem as obvious to us. But most likely, readers would just assume, well, he went up to Jerusalem. Because you always went up to Jerusalem. That's the way they described going to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem. And that's the natural understanding, given that Caesarea is right there next to Jerusalem. So in all likelihood, he goes up to Jerusalem, and he greets the church. 
He greets the apostles that are there. He greets the church. Likely he's sharing with them what God has done amongst the Gentiles that he has been preaching to. He greets the church. And then he finally goes down to his home in Antioch, and he greets the church there. He spends some time there. And then what does he do in verse 23? He departs and goes from place, one place to the next, through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Paul is dedicated to the Lord, first and foundationally. He is dedicated to the lost, and he is dedicated, he is dedicated to the church. He's dedicated to Christians being built up and established. You, you notice that again and again and again in this book. He, he preaches and then he returns to build up and establish. And actually, we're reaching the point in the book of Acts where we know from, uh, you know, sort of, the, the timing of things, that this is when the letters started to be written as well. So we're, we're talking late 40s AD and early 50s. He starts writing letters to the churches he just founded. He writes letters to the Thessalonian church to encourage them. He writes letters to the Galatian area. He writes letters to the Corinthians. He, he's beginning now to write these letters to also encourage the churches, the letters that have become our New Testament. It's marvelous, and, and we see the same kinds of thing in that he returns. What does he do? He goes back to strengthen. I was just say again, we are not all called to be apostles, but we are called to have the same love and seal for the disciples of Jesus Christ that Paul displays here. We, we are all called to do this. We are all called to display this dedication to the building up of the church. Paul is not about, and Acts is not about, some radical preaching that never results in established churches and maturing Christians. And so if we are going to be like the early church, we also have to be dedicated to the building up of disciples in Christ. Now, now brothers and sisters, I think in this passage, Paul displays the three, what I might call, the three major categories of the calling in the life of the Christian. He is dedicated to the Lord, first and foremost, and comprehensively. He is dedicated to the lost, and he is dedicated to the church. Those three categories, if you just let your mind kind of run over the New Testament, those are the three big categories that God calls his people to. Love one another, love the Lord, and love the lost. And so in Paul, we have this exemplary Christian who also was an apostle, and, and we're called to that too. What does it look like for you and for me to strengthen and build up the disciples in the same way that Paul did? What does it look like for you? It might look like seizing Sunday morning as an opportunity to encourage and strengthen your friend in the faith. It might look like displaying unity where your temptation is to display disunity, to display forgiveness where your temptation is to display unforgiveness. It might look like when you go to that small group meeting, that community group gathering, you're looking for ways to communicate the truth of the Bible into the ears of your brothers and sisters to encourage them and build them up in the faith. It might look like coming up at the end of a message to pray with someone, to encourage them when they're weary. It might look like serving. In other words, the New Testament paints a church that is dedicated to building up the church of Christ. And if we go back to what we read at the beginning, or we, I quoted at the beginning, that the, the Christian has this utter dependence on the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord directs us. It commands us, it calls us, so that what we read in Acts is not merely this optional way of life. It is the calling of the Christian. To be dedicated to the Lord and to the lost and the church is not an optional way of life. It is God's calling on our life. It is what it means for the gospel to so grip us that God's priorities are the things that drive us forward. They are what makes us to make the right decisions. They are what causes us to make the choices we make because God has called us to himself and to represent him in the world and to love his people. God has called us to this. And though we are not like Paul in his apostolic ministry, we are like Paul in that God has called us in Christ. 
so that we can love him and honor him and love his people and that this is our purpose whether we are this Wednesday out in the world and representing him faithfully as we do our work with integrity and godliness and hard diligent labor for those who are our, our earthly masters and our employment and, and so forth or whether we are at home and we are laboring to preach the gospel to our children and to work faithfully before them to represent the Lord or whether we're in a season of, of suffering and we're dedicating ourselves to the Lord for his protection and his mercy or whether we have a friend that is in need and we're coming to them like Paul did to build them up in the faith and to encourage them so that we care about their burdens and worries and like Paul said in Galatians we bear one another's burdens these are the things that drive us that motivate us that 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 sort of energize us because in them we are being a biblical church being a biblical church is not mystical. It's not confusing. There's not a new way to do church in every generation. There's not some new style that's most important, some new presentational quality, not some new way in which church should be done. No, it's, it's very simple. It's a church full of people that are united in Jesus Christ that because of that gospel are dedicated to the Lord and dedicated to the lost and dedicated to the building up of the church. That's what God has given to us. And behind those labors, there is a God who is using them to advance his gospel and strengthen his church in the world. There is a God. That's the point. That's the face and the hand behind all that Paul is doing. That is the face in the photo that we must see above all. Ultimately, who is behind Paul? It's the one that called him and claimed him and sent him on this mission. All that Paul does is traced back to that moment on the Damascus Road when Jesus said to him, why are, you why are you persecuting me? I am sending you on a mission to this world. And behind this church is the same God who has sent us on the same kind of mission to dedicate ourselves to him, ourselves to the lost, and ourselves to the church. God is behind the advancing gospel and the building of his church. The Lord Jesus is behind when we throw ourselves into these priorities. He is the one that is energizing our efforts as we do them according to the will of the Lord and for his glory. He is the one who is using us just as he is the one who used Paul. The Lord is advancing his gospel through the dedicated surrender of his people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we rejoice in you. We are grateful for you. Lord, I pray that you would use our church. Lord, in the little decisions that we make on Wednesday morning as we go to work or we take care of the children, Lord, in the big decisions as we think about major ministry opportunities that cause us to give up our comfort zone in, in serious ways, Lord, in fathering and mothering and being a faithful child, Lord, in all of those day-to-day -day life moments of trusting you and serving you and honoring you and being defined by you, Lord, we dedicate ourselves to be useful to you in your kingdom. Use us for your glory. Lord, allow the snapshots of our lives to capture us in dedication to you. Do that this week, Lord. Let there be snapshots that could be taken of any moment or series of moments that find us giving ourselves in dedication to you, to the lost, to your people. We pray and we trust you that you are doing this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me to dismiss you, but also to invite you, if there's any reason that we could pray for you, the community group, 
uh, leaders and their wives come forward at the end. Uh, they don't assume that people in their group are going to come forward. That's fine. Uh, but if there's any reason that we could pray for you, please come forward. We'd love to talk to you. Um, I also want to say on behalf of Aaron um, how grateful we are for you as a church, how much we love you, how much we respect you, how much we learn from you, and what a joy it is to partner together. Um, one final announcement. Um, next Sunday, we have the joy of welcoming uh, Bart Lipscomb, um, who's going to be here on Sunday. He's going to be at the youth meeting on Saturday night and then joining us for church on Sunday, preaching, sharing a report about the Pastors College. Um, so I just want to let you know that so you can look forward to it. We're looking forward to greeting him and expressing our affection for him and his family as they finish up their final third or so of their year there in Louisville. We love you. Have a grace-filled week. We'll see you next Sunday.